this webinar, I would be running you all through what is cerebral palsy, what actually happens in the brain, what happens to the child, what are the different ways uh, that cerebral palsy can manifest, and uh, what are the treatment options, what all needs to be done, okay? Uh, so, um, the uh, topic is uh, labeled as opening up new possibilities for children with brain damage uh, with a focus on stem cell therapy in cerebral palsy. So what is cerebral palsy? Cerebral is brain uh, as it refers to the, the part, the brain, which uh, uh, is the central nervous system here. And the palsy is a disorder of the movement. Uh, okay. Uh, so damage to the brain leading to inability to move or do various activities is essentially what cerebral palsy is damage to the brain generally at the time of birth so what happens to the brain uh, so many times parents tell us my child had hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy had hie now what it's what does hie mean it, hypoxia means lack of oxygen okay so oxygen is the most important uh, part of the air that we breathe in and so oxygen deprivation to the brain leading to ischemia or ischemia leading to hypoxia so what is ischemia that is lack of blood flow to the brain so lack of blood flow may lead to lack of oxygen and leading to a damage to the brain known as encephalopathy so encephal is brain and encephalopathy is damage or a disease or a condition affecting the brain so damage to the brain due to lack of oxygen possibly due to lack of blood supply to the brain leading to brain damage this is what happens in a child who uh, when there is a insult before the time of birth during or after leading to brain damage and manifestation as cerebral palsy. So depending on which type or which part of the brain is affected, you will have different types of cerebral palsy. So you can see here, depending on the regional involvement, this is the brain. You can see two parts of the brain and the red part here depicts the area of the brain which is damaged. So when one half of the brain and one part of the that half is damaged you will see that one hand and one limb is affected known as hemiplegia so one part of the brain and the opposite gets affected so this is a hemiplegic cerebral palsy when you see here you see that both parts of the brain are affected but partly so you can see this red part here and this red part here and hence both hands and both legs are affected known as either two hands are affected or two legs are affected in both cases it will be diplegic that means either two legs so two limbs or upper two limb here you can see again the part of the brain affected is much more than here so both limbs both legs and the trunk the abdomen and the back so everything below neck down is paralyzed then that is known as a quadriplegic cerebral palsy okay now sometimes instead of the bigger brain deeper parts of the brain are affected you can see the red part here this area is known as the basal ganglia now this is the area which controls the movement of the body and here you can see this is known as the ethetoid cerebral palsy in which there are uncontrolled involuntary movement um, uh, it, this generally happens when there is a jaundice after birth, uh, which leads to brain damage. This again is known. This is known as a dystonic cerebral palsy. In dystonic cerebral palsy, the tone of the body keeps on fluctuating. So when the child is awake and wants to do a purposeful activity, he becomes very tired. But if the same child is sleeping, he is relaxed. So the tone becomes high and low, and this is known as the dystonic cerebral palsy. Another type is the ataxic cerebral palsy. You can see the part of brain affected here is the cerebellum, which is the small brain. And here you get a condition where the child's activities are extremely incoordinated, 
as if it's a drunken child or a person who drinks and you can see the movements are uncoordinated and that is known as ataxia so because the cerebellum is affected this type of cerebral palsy is known as ataxic cerebral palsy so let's look at it again in pictorial form damage to the motor cortex or pyramidal tracts here so the which i had shown you here you can see this part and this part here so you can see the legs here are crossing over because of tightness of certain muscles which are in the inner thigh so that is known as adductor spasticity and there is a scissoring of the limbs you can see that the legs are crossed this is known as scissoring of the limbs so this is cross another is the hemiplegic you can see that only one side is affected and this is known as hemiplegic cerebral palsy here you can see a spastic cerebral palsy a child who is very tight you can see that the lower limbs are tight the child uh, is unable to get up because of tightness or even if the child stands the legs are very tight and you can see the while moving though he is moving the leg the leg is going into a scissor shape so tense muscles and when you move the leg it is difficult to move uh, because of tightness or spasticity this is one of the most common type of cerebral palsy this this kinetic type when there is a movement problem you what do you see here that when you make the child lie down the head goes to one side the arm is extended the other arm goes into a bent posture or become stiff and legs are stiff this is one of the posture for basal ganglia affectation or dyskinetic or dystonic cerebral palsy let us see here this is how it is you can see when the child wants to pick up something he or she cannot go directly to the item and the hand moves here and there and goes into a twisted form so there is a fluctuating muscle tone involuntary movements movements which the child cannot control this disappears during sleep and increases with stress or when the child is excited or when the child wants to do a particular activity this interferes with movement as well as with speech eating using of hands legs everything is affected and this happens in 20% of the children with cerebral palsy there are two types choreoethetoid cerebral palsy and dystonic cerebral palsy when i showed you damage to the small brain cerebral cerebellar involvement or ataxic cerebral palsy you can see the legs are in a different shape ataxic cerebral palsy again balance is poor needs support to stand speech is like a stammering or a dysarthric speech inability to walk in a straight line and tendency to fall a small percentage of cerebral palsy children show this uh, um kind of ataxia you can see here the child is unable to stand still when he is walking there is a drunken gait tendency to fall on either side and when the hand is uh, straightened there is a movement or um, in the hand and while walking you can see that the child has lot of incoordination so this is a ataxic cerebral palsy again Two or one or two features may happen together. For example, spasticity and dystonia can happen together. This, this would be a mixed type of cerebral palsy. This is a child with mixed cerebral palsy. You can see has lot of involuntary movements as well as there is spasticity. So this is a child with a mixed type of cerebral palsy having two types of um, issues. You can see that there is involuntary movements as well as spasticity so what are the causes so what are the causes if you divide the causes we can see that the most common is low birth weight you can see especially in developing countries about 35 to 40 percent of the children who are born um, who are born with a low birth weight tend to have less developed brain function and leading to delayed development uh 22 percent maternal factors now maternal factors may may start from before birth generally infections known as torch infections 
toxoplasma infection, cytomegalovirus infection, herpes infection. Now this, when the mother has an infection and the child is in the womb, yet the brain development is affected many a time accompanied with other conditions like uh, inability to hear, vision involvement, brain size is smaller. So the brain development or, or this microcephaly. So uh, this is before birth. Nutrition, if nutrition is affected or if the placenta is not formed properly, then blood supply to the brain is affected. Thereby the child is smaller, nutritionally affected and brain development is not proper. During the time of birth, if there is obstructed labor, there is a prolonged labor, uh, the child passes stool in the womb that is not, and leads to a meconium aspiration. All these factors again contribute to uh, brain damage and cerebral palsy. After birth, uh, there are when the glucose goes down or there is <coughs> increased uh, jaundice is there and all these conditions will lead to possibility of uh, brain damage leading to cerebral palsy. So before birth, there can be congenital abnormalities as uh, an infection to the mother. During birth, the lack of oxygen, brain hemorrhage. Uh, after birth, infection to the brain uh, due to fever, head trauma, jaundice, uh, convulsions, low sugar. So common medical errors which could cause wrongly administered drugs, failure to carry out proper tests at the right time, starvation of uh, oxygen, unnoticed fetal distress, and non-action of the fetus within uh, when the child is in the womb and distress is not picked up. So what actually happens in cerebral palsy? So let's look at this graph here. You can see in prematurity, what happens? The prematurity can be triggered by intrauterine infection, may lead to an early label. So before the child is ready to come out, the, there is induction of labor and there is prematurity. So maybe like a seventh month or a sixth month delivery very very uh, or eighth month the children are uh, not re yet ready to come out but because of various factors there is pre uh, premature birth may lead to intraventricular hemorrhage so they can be bleeding in the brain can lead to periventricular watershed zones that means that uh, the uh, lack of oxygen and lack of blood supply to the area of the brain which is currently growing or multiplying and anatomical factors leading to um, uh, compression or uh, um, difficult birth uh, leading to lack of oxygen. So this leads to ischemia and also infection and inflammation can contribute to further damage. That leads to at the cellular level release of factors which will cause inflammation known as cytokines, release of reactive oxygen species which can cause further oxidative damage and uh, excitotoxicity via glutamate. So these are various mechanisms at the cellular level leading to periventricular leukomalacia. So many parents tell us, my child has periventricular leukomalacia. So the, your child doesn't have periventricular leukomalacia. The brain affected shows periventricular leukomalacia. I will show you in an MRI brain what this actually means. And when a child, when this happens, when the child is born is at high risk for developing cerebral palsy. So periventricular leukomalacia generally gives rise to a spastic or a quadriplegic kind of cerebral palsy because of severe damage to the cerebrum. So how do we know a well, child could have cerebral palsy? So when the child is born, born, either the child is floppy. So you can see a floppy child here. When you are holding the child, the child is totally listless, lethargic, doesn't have any movement or even wants to, you know, raise his neck. So that's a floppy child or the child is stiff. So when you hold the child, the child goes into a stiffness and cries a lot. That's a very typical sign of children with uh, cerebral palsy, very, very early signs. Excessive lethargy, irritability, high-pitched cry, poor head control, weak suckle reflex. So that's why we ask the parents whether the child was able to suckle after birth, uh, is unable to feed, so feeding difficulties, also one of the indicators that there is something wrong with the child. So what you find in a child with uh, cerebral palsy is if this is the normal progression that you see in a child, this progression or the development of milestone is delayed. So between zero to one, the child should be able to sleep on his stomach, then uh, start sitting up, crawling, 
over a period of four to five months is able to sit and stand at the age of eight to nine months and walk up between 10 months to 12 months at a year. So if this development is delayed, then you have to understand that there is something wrong with your child and take the child to a pediatrician right away. So what are the main problems that you see? Difficulty in walking, difficulty in gripping, using your hands to grip toys, tone is either low or high, sometimes repeated chest infections leading to cough, cold and fever, poor balance in the body, other problems which can happen is pain, intellectual disability as mental retardation, an inability to walk, a child who has never stood, there can be hip displacement because the child has never stood and there is no weight bearing. The child would could be nonverbal, may not be speaking, could have comorbid epilepsy or fits or seizures, can also have along with cerebral palsy behavioral disorders or autism like features, no bladder bowel control, inability to sleep in the night, vision impairment, either due to problem in the eyes or problem in the brain, inability to eat, chew or drink and hearing impairment. So any of these problems could be associated with cerebral palsy. Okay. So all these drooling, there would be uh, mouth, uh, the inability to swallow leads to drooling, seizures, the head circumference increased or small. Increased head circumference generally indicates hydrocephalus or filling up of water in the brain due to uh, the circulation getting affected. Uh, as I said, one of the most common thing that we see in a child who is unrehabilitated and is quadriplegic cerebral palsy is a hip joint problem. So this is the hip joint. It is generally a ball and socket joint. And because the child is unable to stand, this doesn't develop and the, the ball is like flat and the hip moves out. So what you see here is the hip moving out of the socket. And this is sometimes a very painful condition and prevents the child from sitting properly as well as cannot stand. So this needs orthopedic correction. So this needs to be corrected uh, before the child can be rehabilitated or made to stand. So what is advised is that x-ray should be done regularly for any child who cannot stand or walk. If this is detected early just by maneuvering or positioning, further uh, deformity can be prevented. If it is too much, it has moved out too much, then surgical intervention will be required. Now, when we look at cerebral palsy, why is it important for us to pay attention to this condition? Because the number of statistics is very, very high. You can see that even in a developed country like United States, 2.5 2 children out of 1,000 are affected with cerebral palsy. So it's not just the developing nation, uh, but also developed countries which have a high number of cerebral palsy. In India, we see three out of thousand births uh, in three or thousand birth cerebral palsy, and many of this is preventable. There is an increasing prevalence all around the world that you can see here. This is a statistics which is increasing, and but early detection helps. So we have discussed this areas of brain damage. It can be cerebrum, the whole brain, a deep part of the brain, or the cerebellum, or the whole brain, multiple areas of the brain together. Any of this can be affected, leading to affectation of movement, vision, balance, having fits or seizures, behavioral issue, communication issue, and learning. So what can we see in the brain? Now, this is the MRI of the brain, which is normal. So you can see the brain structure here normal. This is the, what you can see is the sulci and gyrine. This is the normal brain developed. You can see the skull here and the brain is completely within the skull. There is no gap between the skull and the brain. Okay, so this is a normal MRI. So this is a normal MRI. You can see the ventricle here, the fluid, which is like a thin slit. Okay, now look here. This slit is slightly enlarged. What does that mean? It means the thickness of the brain here is reduced. So this is known as ventricular megaly. The more this fluid, you can see more this fluid, more severe the problem. That means the brain is shrunk or the cortex is thin. 
that means the amount of cells which should be there in the brain is lesser so bigger the ventricular cavity more severe the problem because the tissue is less so mild affectation severe affectation okay so what does ventricle do it nourishes the brain and the spinal cord the csf inside acts as a a way a conduit to remove the waste products the carbon dioxide which the cells uh, emitting and also it acts as a shock absorber so that if there is any jerky movement the csf can absorb it and prevent injury to the brain and spine so what does abnormality in this ventricles indicate that there is a delay in development there could be motor deficit cognition uh, and vision can be affected there can be seizures there is a high risk of autism possibly and there can be an increased skull size uh so this is a cortical injury now if there is a problem in the white matter now what is the mind what is the white matter when the brain is brain has cells and it gives out wiring so if the wiring is affected then the connections are not formed properly that is the white matter of the brain which is deep inside so if white matter is affected the connections are affected and thereby problem in motor function so the corona radiata here is basically indicates the connection of the brain with the two parts of the brain connecting with each other the brain talking or connecting to the spinal cord so the white matter is like electrical wire which passes messages between different areas of the brain and damage to the white matter can lead to all these different problems if it is because of lack of oxygen it can lead to spasticity ataxia and visual loss the cause uh, the problem in white matter could also be genetic it is known as leukodystrophy um, and this is a progressive condition though it gives a picture like cerebral palsy you will generally see that the child is worsening day by day so what is now periventricular leukomalacia this is a very common term that parents talk about but do not understand what it means so now look at the brain i showed you that brain normal will look like this however the ventricle around the ventricle you can see this white part so this is ventricle this is periventricle so periventricular whiteness in the mri is known as periventricular leukomalacia now why does it occur and what does it indicate due to lack of oxygen the first part of the brain which is affected is the ventricular zone this area around the ventricle has cells stem cells in the brain which are multiplying and these cells when they multiply they go out and form the rest of the brain but when these cells are damaged they form dead cell layer or they form a um, um uh, they form uh, also affect the connections and they form a white zone known as leukomalacia more the leukomalacia more the damage so you can see here it is more and the brain formation of the cell cortex will be shrunken also the connection because the cells are less the connection which is sent becomes lesser too so the white matter also gets affected in this condition so connectivity to ventricle and different lobes affected this is a crucial area for blood supply and it is the most common type of injury in the cerebral palsy okay now deeper parts of the brain here you can see deeper parts of the brain when they are affected if you remember the deeper parts of the brain the basal ganglia if it is affected then that leads to a dyskinetic kind of cerebral palsy leading to movement disorder now that is injury to the basal ganglia you can see the white part here is the injury to the basal ganglia and the thalamus now glyotic changes in the cortex again as that shown you this is the normal brain with all its uh, curves and sulci and gyri and here you can see the sulci gyri is reduced the cortex has thinned out and you have more fluid inside now a thin cortex means and all uh, means lesser tissue and what you can see here 
is the gliotic scar. Means when the cell dies, it leads to a scarring known as gliosis. So gray matter or the cortex of the brain controls the muscle, the processing of the sensation, memory, emotion, speech, everything. And the, uh, the different damages in the brain or different congenital abnormalities lead to different manifestation of cerebral palsy. The corpus callosum, this part you can see here is the corpus callosum. Corpus callosum is the part when the brain sends out down wiring will gather here and this bundle will be the connection of the brain to the other part of the cortex or the other part of the brain as well as to the spinal cord. And when you see, you can see a thinning. See, this is the normal and you can see here thinned out corpus callosum. That means the brain matter here is less. It has sent down lesser wires and thereby there is a thinned out electrical wiring which leads to lesser signals going down to the spinal cord or the other part of the brain. So connections and information processing is affected here. That leads to again spasticity, spastic paraplegia, paraparesis, schizors, cognitive deficit as well as visual problem. Okay. You can see here again urgenesis. That means earlier itself, it's not being formed properly. This could have happened when the child is inside the womb. Cortical atrophy, if you remember, I told you this is a skull, okay? And the cortex should be flush with the skull. But here you can see the there is a lot of fluid the amount of fluid is more and the sulci gyri, it's like a dried cauliflower. That's why what I call, if you see a cauliflower which is fresh, which, which has a lot of life, you will see a different shape. And when the water is reduced or the cauliflower is dried, the cortex that you can see is shrunken. Okay, so this could be due to lack of oxygen. Also, it could be genetic conditions like leukodystrophy, which, uh, which could lead to these particular trophy okay pachygyria now pachygyria is a congenital problem that means the brain has not formed properly you can see the number of sulci gyra less the brain is almost looking flat like a mouse brain so the difference between a mouse brain and a human brain is the ridges the number of ridges that the human brain has is much more because the number of cells that the brain has is much more if the number of cells are less, then you get a lower uh, formation of brain or a brain of a lower mammal. So that's called pachygyria, less number of gyri. When we look at the fiber tract, this is uh, a DTI of the fiber. This is another form of imaging. You can see the connections here, red and green. But here you can see that the connections are lesser than this. So you can see a reduction in the callosal fibers. Um, so we saw MRI, we saw DTI, and now here we are seeing an advanced form of scan known as a PET CT scan of the brain. Now the PET CT scan gives us information of functioning of the brain matter or the gray matter, which is still there. So what we find is that even if the brain matter is there, it may not be functioning optimally or to the extent that it should. So that's why understanding brain functioning or brain metabolism, we get a better understanding with the PET CT scan of the brain. So if you look at the brain here, the green is normal and you can see these parts which are blue which on MRI will look normal, but on PET scan, you can see that these are functioning less. So this, this part is the basal ganglia, which is functioning less. This here is the thalamus. All these blue areas are functioning lesser. This is the thalamus. This blue part here is the thalamus, which is the connection between the brain and the spinal cord. The cerebellum. The small brain is blue. You can see this. The rest of the brain is normal, but this part is blue. The brain functioning, though you can see the morphology is all right, but you can see the cortex is thin and it is not uniformly green. Some areas are blue. 
so this is the motor cortex this is the motor cortex the area which will is important for the movement of the of the body again you can see here this is the visual cortex the back of the brain is the occipital lobe or the visual cortex is blue that means vision is affected in this child this is the area known as medial temporal or mesial temporal this is the area for learning memory as well as for emotional expression so what are the treatment options now we have seen different types of brain damages now what are the medical and surgical options to help a child medical options can be anticholinergics for uncontrolled body movements anticonvulsants or medicines for seizures muscle relaxants like baclofen liofen to reduce the muscle um, tightness and anti inflammatory for pain management for those children who have constipation stool softeners botox is a med is a injection or a poison which is used to reduce spasticity botox ba basically is a botulinum toxin Botul botulinum or clostridium botulinum is a bacteria which uh, releases the botulinum toxin which can be injected at nerve endings to remove the connection of the nerve to the muscle thereby reducing spasticity um, so that can be used locally the effect lasts for about three to six months if there is too much of tightness in the tendon thereby causing deformities and prevention of the leg or the foot uh, to be kept down then the tendon uh, lengthening or the tendon you can see here this is a tendon which is very tight and you can see the z here the z causes this tendon to lengthen so that the heel can touch the ground if you can see here and this here you can see that the tendon which is too tight can be cut and and be transferred to another place or there can be a release of the contracture so this is generally for hamstrings so these are Selective rhizotomy, sorry, this is selective rhizotomy. Rhizotomy, this is the spinal nerves or the connections which can be cut so that unwanted uh, or uncontrolled signaling can be prevented and spasticity or tightness can be reduced. This is a very um, uh, difficult surgery. Okay. Most important is rehabilitation, physical therapy, physiotherapy, very important and occupational therapy teaching the child how to eat, dr stand, drink, play, uh, wear his clothes, brush his teeth, all of that. Speech therapy, very important to help not only speech, but also swallowing, chewing, um, uh, speaking, cognition, everything. Aquatic therapy, exercise in water helps to reduce the tightness as well as improve coordination. Psychological intervention, counseling both for the child as for the parents as well as cognitive rehabilitation when the child has limited cognition diet and nutrition to help improve the overall condition of the child sometimes helps to control the seizures as well so these are the conventional treatments so we have had all these treatments and if you see all of these treatments help the child from outside but what is the main problem the main problem is damage in the brain as we saw in the mri so are we doing enough to correct that let us see what our options are so what is the unmet medical need that rehabilitation surgical treatment medical interventions are available they help reduce spasticity control the movement to some extent however the underlying brain damage is still there and as a child grows the brain damage remains which is something which has not yet been handled so hence we need a treatment which can accelerate brain development improve the brain function so that all these treatments that we are giving from outside become more effective so that's why a ray of hope comes through the stem cells stem cells just like other revolutions which the mankind has seen like electricity internet flight um, and in medical uh, treatment, uh, radiological diagnosis, antibiotics, laparoscopy. Similarly, stem cell therapy is a treatment which has an idea whose time has come, which is here to help patients with neurological disorders lead a better quality life. It has helped to address 
the unmet needs in neurological patients. So let us understand what is the role of stem cell therapy in cerebral palsy and what all conditions it can help. It can help a whole, a whole uh, lot of uh, different conditions, neurodevelopmental disorders, or also disorders of the brain and spine, which has been acquired later. So why do we need a treatment which will help these patients? Because the numbers are huge. Statistics, if we see cerebral palsy, 17 million in the world, autism, 70 million in the world, intellectual disability, 7 million in the world. So numbers are high. So what we need is a definitive treatment which can address the brain damage. And that's where stem cell stands today. So what are stem cells? Stem cells are basically cells in our body which can multiply many, many fold and can become any part of the body if given the proper conditions. So just like a stem of a tree can give, can give rise to branches with proper water and uh, fertilizer, similarly cells in our body can, if given proper environment, become liver cells, cardiac cells, brain cells, bone cells, cartilage cells. So it depends on where do you put them. So where do we get these cells from? All of us at one point of time were a one stage cell. We were in the womb of our mother uh, as one cell. And then we became four cells, eight cells, we became a bunch of cells. And as we grew, we became a small child and then an adult. So these cells were used to form different organs in our body. And when we put the cells in the laboratory and we grow them, we can make them bone, nerve, cardiac tissue or pancreatic cells. So this is a potential of stem cells and we can get them from a one cell stage or a three to four cell stage or we can get it from the adult body. And depending on the source that we take it from, their potential changes and, and also their possibility of side effect changes. So how do they work? What do they do actually? One cell, a particular stem cell has the potential to multiply many, many times. So one cell becomes many, many cells. Number two, the cell can become any part of the body. It can become liver cells, blood cells, nerve cells, cardiac cells. It releases many, many growth factors. It releases factors which can help repair a particular organ. And it improves blood supply. For example, if you put in the vicinity of the brain, it will improve the blood supply in the brain, leading to increased oxygenation and thereby repair process. So what is regenerative medicine? You have the brain here. You have the damage. You can see the dark blue part. The cells will go and repair the damage. And the damage is reduced. Or the part of the brain which is functioning less is helped to function better. What are the different types of cells? The, the most primitive and the most um, potentially strong cell is an embryonic stem cell, uh, which is uh, derived from a three to four day fertilized egg or embryo. But this has a lot of ethical issues surrounding it also because one cell can make a whole child in nine months. There is a possibility of a teratoma or tumorogenicity. Hence, Ethically as well as scientifically, currently it is a no-no for clinical medicine or transplantation. We do have the cord blood stem cells, which is a good possibility, has good potential for many uh, patients. However, its under understanding of how much can it be used is still evolving. But we do have adult stem cells here. You can see from our bone, from our teeth, from the fat in our body, stem cells can be taken from our own body to repair our own body. That is self-regeneration. There are no ethical issues here, no long-term side effects, no tumor formation, and hence, it's a green signal. It is a potentially feasible option for treatment purposes. We now have also a new form of stem cell known as induced pluripotent stem cell. These are known as designer stem cells are still being understood and explored and have potential for treatment of disorders, but still a long way to go before it can be used for treatment. So when all these different types of stem cells are put together in one basket and labeled as dangerous, what we are actually doing is, is saying like all these are beverages. 
the, 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 and the Shiva Shrigal as well as the uh, orange juice are beverages and hence both of them are dangerous in the long term. So I will leave it to you to understand whether alcohol and homemade orange juice are similar. Uh, alcohol has long term side effects when used but homemade orange juice made by a mother with love and care has only nutritional value and no side effects. So adult stem cells are like homemade orange juice you get only positives there are no side effects so at urogen brain and spine institute we use adult stem cells taken from the patient's own body from the bone marrow because it is safe it is non-tumorogenic there are no rejection issues easily obtainable and no ethical issues like we are not killing an embryo and we are not taking a life so what is the scientific basis for stem cell therapy? A lot of research has happened over the last 50 years to understand stem cells. The first ever award or a Nobel Prize which was awarded to stem cells was in 1990. In 2007, uh, another scientist, uh, so Martin Evans, received the M Nobel Prize for embryonic stem cell derivation. Recently, in 2012, two scientists were awarded the Nobel Prize for induced pluripotent stem cells. But the first ever stem cells which were found, understood, and was awarded the Nobel Prize was the derivation or demonstration of stem cells in the bone marrow way back in 1990. So uh, bone marrow derived stem cells are the most understood, most um, uh, researched, and hence uh, more uh, are feasible to be used for various purposes. Uh, also, our uh, Bible of Medical Sciences, the Harrison's textbook of medicine also has a chapter on stem cells now. Um, in India itself, there is a lot of political motivation and backing for stem cells. Our ex-president spoke about uh, research on stem cells to be a focus in India way back in 2014. Our Prime Minister, uh, Sri Narendra Modi, went and met Professor Yamanaka, who was awarded uh, the Nobel Prize in 2012 for induced pluripotent stem cell to bring this technology back to India. Uh, he also supports the use of stem cells and supports children with disability, um, um, has a lot of empathy empathy and uh, understanding for their condition. Um, uh, so what neurological disorders can be treated? Autism, cerebral palsy, intellectual disability, muscular dystrophy, uh, brain injury, stroke, traumatic brain injury, smile con injury, dementia, and other neurological conditions. At Neurogen, we do a lot of scientific work. We have over 86 um, uh, Articles published in peer-reviewed national and international journals. Uh, in cerebral policy, we have published 12 uh, uh, um, articles, including case reports. We have written a book, uh, a chapter for a book uh, known as Cerebral Policy Challenges for the Future. Uh, so uh, our credibility, our research, our know-how uh, has reached international stature. We have written chapters in various books. So how can stem cell help? various neurological disorders. The earlier thought was that um, once the central nervous system is damaged, it cannot be repaired. However, we do know that use of cellular therapy has stimulated the potential or the possibility of repairing the brain and replacing the damaged tissue. There are a lot of publications, about 32 publications on cerebral palsy all over the world showing uh, 98 patients which have received stem cells and with 82% success rate different type of stem cells used in various, um, by various scientists and groups are core blood, bone marrow, peripheral, uh, neural stem cells, olfactory and sheathing cells, human embryonic stem cells given by different routes. So how is the treatment done at Neurogen Brain and Spine Institute? Um, at Neurogen Brain and Spine Institute in India, the treatment is done in very simple three-step process. First, the bone marrow is removed from the hip bone stem cells are separated in the laboratory on the same day in few hours and injected back into the spinal fluid the cells taken from our patient's own body with minimal manipulation not multiplied not kept out for long no chemical mixing put back into the near the brain taken from the bone marrow put near the brain so that the brain perfusion can be increased. So this is how the treatment is done. Bone marrow is removed when the child is sleeping, is processed in the laboratory. This is red, thick blood-like cells, and these uh, are separated in the laboratory. You're counted, looked at its healthiness, and injected via a very 
thin needle into the spinal fluid so there is no cut there are no stitches just one needle in the hip bone and one needle in the back so a very very simple procedure bone marrow removal when it is removed this is how it is it is it undergoes centrifugations and here is what we get so this is a clump of millions of stem cells different types of stem cell put together having various different actions counted and injected so many people ask me bone marrow how many cells how many cells millions of cells of different types we have hematopoietic stem cells these are blood forming stem cells other heterogeneous population of non hematopoietic stem cells which are not there in any other source of stem cells you have endothelial progenitor cells mesenchymal stem cells multipotent adult progenitor cells uh, multipotent adult stem cells very small embryonic like stem cells all of these have differing actions and thereby complement each other and that's why bone marrow becomes a very feasible very safe very effective way of handling or treating neurological conditions and then we inject the stem cells into the spinal fluid now this is very important because of two factors what are we doing injecting into the spinal fluid the brain and the spine ends at l1 level we are injecting below it into the csf this csf takes the cells to the damaged part there is a homing instinct into these in the cells and they go and home to the injured side and because we have put them into the spinal fluid they do not go anywhere else they do not go into the liver lungs spleen or skin or anywhere else so the number of cells required is actually much lesser than when the cells are injected intravenously so the quantity required is less the efficacy is high and safety is assured so this is where the cells are injected so not into the brain not into the spinal cord into the spinal fluid so what are the results uh, we have uh, treated over 1000 patients we have analyzed the results in about 660 and we find that about 91% of the children show improvement to various degrees a 30% to some mild extent ability of the parents to handle the child becomes easier 41% have moderate improvement and 20% a significant improvement so that their quality of life has improved significantly uh, in diplegic cerebral palsy we find uh, improvement at in different areas for example sitting balance improves in all the children standing balance improves in almost 90% children walking balance also improves in 90% children ambulation those children who are not ambulatory in 50% to 70% ambulation is improved and we can see that hand movements overhead activities so all these are improved in a child with uh, uh, diplegic cerebral palsy in quadriplegic cerebral palsy again sitting balance remarkably improves oromotor improves speech improves their cognition understanding muscle tone becomes towards normal neck control some children who are quadriplegic have also start, started walking children with dystonic and athetoid cerebral palsy their involuntary movements reduce considerably their ability to sit balance improves use of hand speech cognition so in multiple area holistically there is an improvement in most of the areas so how does this happen over what period of time how much time does it take that's what that's a question parents usually or every time ask us so it is a process so suppose there is a 4 or 5 year old child with barely any neck um, control or sitting balance this child has not been able to achieve anything for years it's a process it will take at least 6 months to achieve some neck balance and sitting tolerance so immediately what do you see you see immediately over a week you will see reduction in the muscle tone and involuntary movements some improvement in voluntary control and minimal head holding that is within the week over a week to 3 months you will see improved gross functioning ability to cross the midline initiation of finger opening and closing it's easier for the parents to handle the child the child becomes more 
cooperative for therapy there is improved oromotor functioning and tongue, tongue movement in, sitting balance becomes much better and integration of the abnormal reflexes as the child grows certain reflexes the child should be losing but in a child with cerebral palsy the primitive reflexes are still there those reflexes are lost and fresh or newer reflexes are gained cognitive improvement happens continuously that is something which we have seen in maximum patients then over three to six months you will see sequential development of patterns like sitting without support initiation of weight shifting ability to stand ability to take steps um, improved chewing improved hand like high hand coordination then after six months over a year taking step with gaiters decrease in dependency increase motor movement development of equilibrium reaction and improved speech so you can see the improvement happens over three months six months and a year and reduction in uh, disability is seen over a period of a year with good rehabilitation so this is the book that we have written these are our books uh, and these are our publications on cerebral palsy which are available online um, let us see a few videos and pet scans now this is a pet scan before the stem cell treatment you can see these blue parts this is the basal ganglia and this is the thalamus this is before the treatment you can see after the treatment this green indicates improved brain function so you can see the blue part has improved the blue part has improved so beautiful improvement in the functioning of the brain now how you use it depends on how good a rehabilitation you do you can see here before the treatment this is after the treatment so even you know uh, temporal lobe as well as the mesial temporal structures have improved again thalamus before the treatment after the treatment improvement in six months the cortex you can see the motor cortex here is damaged is not as well developed this is six months later you can see the cortex thickening has also improved and functioning has also improved again here you can see the blue part the cortex is so thin after the treatment you can see the cortex has thickened or the functioning has improved the cerebellum before the treatment has started functioning six months later again you can see thalamus before the treatment after the treatment cerebellum before the treatment after the treatment so these are objective evidences that you can see in many many patients cortex thickness before now thalamus before the treatment after the treatment cerebellum before the treatment after though it is not completely formed but you can to start seeing the functioning improve again mesial temporal area for learning and understanding you can see has improved overall you can see the cortex also has improved the thalamus has improved so overall the brain is starting to look normal a few videos this is a child with cerebral palsy who was four years old had could not stand independently had difficulty in walking climbing stairs and let us see how he has improved you can see before the treatment just look at the child and look now you can see the difference not only is his neck control and his even the eyes his intelligence his ability to do activities his uh, balance you can see the balance on one leg independent kneel standing wanting to do things he's trying to stand up here you can see he's stood on his own and is walking so also motivation of the child has improved so much ability to get up from the floor he needed support here he can get up on his own this is six months and started walking so this is a difference that is in a four-year-old child is seen in six months which is great you what he has not achieved in four years he is achieved in six months and this is remarkable uh, so this is a five-year-old child who uh, again you can see we will see the changes in this child this is before the treatment the uh, he needed some support and uh, that you can see here his uh, agility and ability has increased here he's able to do kneel walking dynamic balance wearing his clothes using his hands here he needed support here he's doing on his own just the child's motivation also you can see he's wanting to do things because he's able to do things kneeling has improved the ability to get up from the floor 
we also give corrective glasses so vision fixation focusing also improves so uh, what is done at eurogen is a holistic therapy you can see here cognitive development improvement in eye contact imitation skills so even cognitively we would work on physical aspects we would work we work on oromotor ability to chew is also improved here you can see though his height has increased his tightness has not and he's gone from walker now to uh, crutches this is the brain of the same child this was before the treatment you can see the gap here has improved you can see the damage here is filled up the cerebellum has started functioning so this is before the treatment this is now you can see that the child's brain has also improved not only the physically but also the brain again this you can see before the treatment and now another child four year eight months was a spastic dystonic quadriplegic child with hydrocephalus there was a quandary about decision whether to do shunting or to do stem cells and our surgeon took the decision to, to do the stem cell therapy first he also had tracheostomy because of breathing difficulty so this is before the treatment you can see floppy neck tight legs uh, inability to look up and tracheostomy after the treatment slowly uh, they worked with us and after six months after three months tracheostomy was actually removed he could attempt to crawl after the treatment here you can see floppy child here ability to get up has improved this happened in a month he could also perform standing sitting and he started walking with support slowly this has happened and you can see that the tracheostomy has also been removed so this is a child who was completely quadriplegic and is now walking right hemiplegic cerebral palsy if you remember one side of the brain damage so the other side is affected uh, in motor uh, development this is a child you can see earlier needed support now he's walking on his own he's jumping and hopping on his own uh, earlier he could do only um, shuffling with his um, buttocks here needing help getting up on his own is much more agile much more aware more intelligent ability to go up here taking a lot of time just look at the child more happy more wanting to do things more daring to do climbing stairs developed independently which was not possible in dystonic cerebral palsy when there is too much movement again a five-year-old child you can see that this child had a lot of irrelevant movement and had needed so much support before the treatment now is able to do kneel standing on his own ability to do activities much better crawling is much better here is attempting but unable to do quadruped reaching is able to do because children have voluntary control is affected speech has improved uh, ability to uh, imitate and say things hand-eye coordination is better he's able to hold smaller objects so dystonia has reduced overall five years case of cerebral palsy again improvement in six months you can see can crawl in alternate pattern earlier he was hopping here the child is cra crawling one leg in front of the other even kneel walking is much more better earlier he needed support uh, and he would tumble down you can see the difference in this child getting up from the floor and climbing onto the chair he is able to attempt now he could not do that before so this is the improvement you've seen in six months improved sitting balance and gripping so hand function is also improved earlier he would not even attempt he can now crawl on the steps so overall movement of the trunk of the hand of the leg muscles uh, all these is improving or has improved over three to six months months what did not happen in four to five years was achieved in six months so the time scale for any improvement reduces rem uh, drastically with stems after stem cell therapy 11 years old now look at the older child with severe uh, athletoid cerebral palsy cognition was also affected he had severe movements no control at all had severe tantrums he would have severe behavioral issues with the stem cell therapy you can see the difference in this child and this child he was not cooperating at all now he sits if you give him a hand he attempts to get up he attempts to walk he is able to stand without any support 
he wants to stand now he is attempting to do side walking here you can see so much effort here he is able to walk with two hand support so and even started climbing down the stair with support this is a child who is totally dependent did not show any improvement in 11 years has shown this improvement in a year ataxic self group this is a different kind where cerebellum is involved has shown one of the best results four year old child who has ataxic cerebral palsy you can see that you know he has incoordination here you can see his coordination is much better with he needed weighted cuff to keep him more stable but now that is not required ability to sit from floor to stool is better he is able to climb the stairs climb up on a window sill and sit he is able to stand earlier he would fall down had severe incoordination is now able to walk improved walking balance is improved earlier he had severe ataxia now that ataxia has reduced ability to use his hand is much better vocabulary his identification of body parts identifying animals so cognition has also improved in this child along with speech so speech cognition walking use of hand movements all milestones have improved in this child now this is a child uh, you can see she's an older child we're looking at the trunk control ability to hold her trunk more independently reduce um, imbalance while crawling crawling is much better you can see that improved trunk control uh balance while kneel walking is better she is able to balance things better but she doesn't need support imbalance while walking has reduced you can see her imbalance here and in the other frame you can see the balance better getting up more quickly swaying has reduced when you close your eyes she is able to stand much more stable hand writing you you can see inside this round she is able to do it much better can get up easily from the floor and so overall the ataxia has reduced another child 13 year old with cerebral palsy we are looking at older ages as well uh, earlier we treat better the results climbing up the stairs is much better climbing down the stairs is also easier earlier as compared to earlier is much more faster legs are much more straighter holding the pen and writing is easier is improved his handwriting is much better able to attempt sitting in cross leg which was not possible earlier at all because of severe dystonia and spasticity able to lift object from the floor so dynamic balance has improved in this child another child who was 2 years old um no no global developmental disorder came to us uh, when he came he was to, like a small 6 year old child with vi cortical visual impairment cord vision was affected uh, so he improved slowly and steadily with better weight balance crawling was had improved his vision improved so he was able to recognize his parents look at them earlier he used to cry a lot balance improved he started sitting much better he started standing uh, with support then slowly walking and is now climbing stairs so this is a progress we saw in about 9 months to a year in this child so the milestones which were completely stopped have restarted this child from uganda came to us when she had a damage to the brain Uh, still 3 years she was absolutely normal at the age of 3 years there was unfortunately an accident um, where she had she got suffocated inside a closed car and that lead led to a brain damage also vomiting leading to aspiration she was extremely seriously afflicted and she came to us 3 months after the injury she was she had no milestones all milestones had regressed completely she had severe brain damage she had no vision at all she had seizures as well now this is a child who has improved slowly and steadily you could see earlier barely able to turn now she is able to turn she looks up she follows her vision has improved a standing balance her neck control her sitting ability to vocalize has improved the brain has started functioning better now this child is going to school 
so the idea is to go back to school and now this child is at least able to sit in the school so if not 100 percent normal in a year this child has progressed from nothing to something this is uh, so, so this is a child uh, whose non balance has, as, as well as improved speech and ability to speak and and even following commands has improved yeah. she's a much better visual tracking where she had zero vision <laughs> so this is a child who has very severe brain damage this is her pet scan before the treatment the top row here is the before the treatment you can see barely any activity all these blue areas are damaged little bit of activity here in the lateral temporal lobe but nothing here you can see no tissue here at all no activity this is the area of the vision this is before the treatment this is about six to nine months later you can see brain activity coming back you can see the visual area improving that's why the visual tracking improving the cerebellum starting that's why the mouth movement has improved so there is though it's not completely dormant a lot of activity has started coming back and that's why the child is showing clinical improvement this is what stem cell therapy has been able to achieve you can see all the damage you can see the brain started to function another 10 year old child standing here with a lot of step out on standing frame and now you can see here standing kneel standing much better able to maintain the quadruped earlier you see how much support he required now he's able to get up from the floor see the difference in these two this is before this is now his balance is improved earlier he would cry and cry earlier he's able to get up from the bed independently which was not possible earlier able to walk now which was not possible earlier at all again his brain you can see before the treatment the thalamus now the thalamus has started to improve so the the cerebellum before the treatment and now you can see here there is a gap there is no tissue here this cannot fill up but you can see the functioning here the thin cortex here it has started to function so the area which is functioning less starts to function better so what what are the side effects or the complications in using patients own stem cells no major adverse events or complications are seen no neurological reversal or deterioration however those children who have a history of seizures or who have a history or whose eeg is abnormal there's a three percent chance to trigger seizures after the treatment there is a possibility of a spinal headache which may come after the treatment in about 10 percent of the patients but it is self-limiting three to four days the child becomes better nausea vomiting or local pain is again for a few days after the treatment within the hospital stay itself so no long-term side reversible side effects are seen so using patient's own stencils autologous bone marrow derived stencils safe and effective and you can you have seen that there are so many uh, children example that you've seen where it has helped them with no major side effects so this is neurogen Brain and Spine Institute in Navi, Mumbai, where all holistic treatment is done under one roof. Uh, we've treated patients, over 7,000 patients from 65 different countries. Uh, this is our state-of-art um, um, operation room or operation theater and our state-of-art laboratory, world-class patient care comprehensive rehabilitation under one room it is a multidisciplinary ap approach the team approach of various therapists and and physician and surgeon uh, various therapy and activities happen under the same roof and neuro rehabilitation helps by combining with stem cell therapy it's a teamwork 
It's just like we put a seed and the seed is the stem cell while neuro rehabilitation is the fertilizer and water. This is the multidisciplinary uh, approach that we um, uh, use. Pediatric physical therapy, a big part of for cerebral palsy. Adult physical therapy, pediatric occupational therapy, adult occupational therapy, speech therapy, psychological intervention, special education, diet and nutrition advice. Other facilities are aquatic therapy, walking track for spinal cord injury patients, autism child development center, hand rehabilitation, and sensory integration therapy. Uh, the books that we have written for professionals, for doctors, medical community, as well as for patients and their caretakers to help them understand the condition better, to help them know uh, what to be done. This is a book for guidebook for cerebral palsy. This is a core uh, team, Dr. Alok Sharma, who's the neurosurgeon and director of Neurogen Vein and Spine Institute. The vision, the visionary behind this novel treatment, uh, 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 neuro regenerative rehabilitation therapy. This is me, Dr. Nandini. I've been working with Dr. Sharma uh, over nine years and I had the medical services. Dr. B.T. Jacob, the head of neuro rehabilitation, who himself is above 75 years old and he uh, has more than 50 years of experience in neuro rehabilitation. Dr. Prerna Bade, one of the deputy directors, one of the pillars of Neurogen, who uh, was with Dr. Sharma even before Neurogen started, where the concept of stem cell was brought into play. She is the head of regenerative lab. Uh, Dr. Himangi Sane, a physician herself and head of the research and development, herself afflicted with motor neuron disease, a neurodegenerative condition, and a stem cell recipient herself. This is our accreditation. Uh, our laboratory has good laboratory and good manufacturing uh, practice accreditation. These are our certificates and awards, best medical practice, national and international awards from European Medical Association, as well as other awards. This is the award to Neurogen for service in uh, to disabilities. This is at the national level. Uh, other national awards. This is our chief minister of Maharashtra giving us the award for the best stem cell therapy center. Scientists in believe these tiny cells may have the potential to help us understand and possibly cure some of our most devastating diseases and conditions. To regenerate the severed spinal cord and lift someone from a wheelchair. To spur insulin production and spare a child from a lifetime of needles. To treat Parkinson's cancer heart disease, and others that affect millions of Americans and the people who love them. Today, uh, with the executive order I am about to sign, we will bring the change that so many scientists and researchers, doctors and innovators, patients and loved ones have hoped for and fought for these past eight years. We will lift the ban on federal funding for promising embryonic stem cell research. <laughs> So in 2009, uh, President Obama lifted the ban on federal funding for embryonic stem cell research. This ban was uh, um, uh, was basically uh, started um, when President Bush was in power in 2001. So for about eight years, the stem cell research in the United States actually uh, had a setback uh, and due to which the other countries in the world started looking at other ethical options for stem cells and that's where the Southeast Asian countries have taken the lead in the stem cell research and treatment, uh, finding other ethical options like adult stem cells and corporate stem cells. This is what President Obama had to say. There's again. no finish line in the work of science. The race is always with us. The urgent work of giving substance to hope and answering those many bedside prayers of seeking a day when words like terminal and incurable are potentially retired from our vocabulary. So this is uh, the aim of Neurogen Pain and Spine Institute. And uh, once uh, it, it, it was seen that the Western countries are basically backing off, that's where uh, the concept of using adult stem cells uh, came into uh, the thought of scientists and researchers in India. And Dr. Sharma is one of the pioneers in that. And uh, our thought was that if we can use our own body stem cells to treat our own uh, disorders, and that's the concept which has come from India millions of millions and uh, of years earlier too and that's why i think we are much ahead uh, 
this concept has gained a lot of credence and there's a lot of evidence which I have also uh, put in forth today and a lot of evidence has developed over the last eight to nine years, um, which now is being uh, taken up by the United States, a very um, path breaking law which has been passed in the United States um, in President Trump's um, um, era is now the use of patients own stem cells to heal one's own body is now the right of a patient for chronic and terminal illnesses and that's something very interesting this is something which we have been saying for a long long time important moment, a very important day. We're looking forward to this for a long time, along with Senator Ron Johnson. And, and I will tell you, we worked hard on this. I never understood why it was hard. They've been trying to have it passed for years. I never understood why. Because I'd see people, friends of mine, and other people I've read about where they travel all over the world looking for a cure. And we have the best medical people in the world, but we have trials and we have long time 12 years 15 years even when things look really promising so many years and i never understood why they didn't do this i called on congress to pass right to try it's such a great name and today i'm proud to keep another promise to the american people as i sign the right to try legislation into law With the right to try law I'm signing today, patients with life-threatening illnesses will finally have access to experimental treatments that could improve or even cure their conditions. These are experimental treatments and products that have shown great promise, and we weren't able to use them before. Now we can use them. And Oftentimes, they're going to be very successful. It's an incredible thing. The right to try also offers new hope for those who either don't qualify for clinical trials or who have exhausted all available treatment options. There were no options, but now you have hope. You really have hope. But as I proudly sign this bill, thousands of terminally ill Americans will finally have the help, the hope, and the fighting chance, and I think it's going to be better than chance, that they will be cured, that they will be helped, that they'll be able to be with their families for a long time, or maybe just for a longer time. But we're able to give them the absolute best as to what we have at this current moment, at this current second. And now we're going to help a lot of people. We're going to help a lot of people. So surprisingly, um, uh, I would say the evidence that this uh, President Trump is referring to is the evidence which has been generated in the Southeast Asian countries and India to be uh, more uh, particular. And uh, further to this came the Charlie's Law which actually uh, uh, talks about using patients' own stem cells, autologous stem cells, to treat incurable neurological disorders like multiple sclerosis, like cerebral palsy, like muscular dystrophy. Uh, and that is a right uh, for chronically ill patients. And that's the Charlie's Law, which has now come into play in, in uh, Texas, in America, USA. So. Uh, we, we're proud to be uh, ahead of time in, in the field of regenerative medicine. So this was a glimpse into how regenerative medicine and stem cell can help a cerebral palsy, how it has helped many, many children. It is safe, it is effective, and has the potential to help many children. Um, thank you, and I would be happy to take questions now. The first question is my brother from Nagaraj. Uh, Padma, uh, my brother is 32 years with congenital epilepsy. Since age of 20, he became immovable. 
uh, as well the feedback is that he's as might be a resolution of cerebral palsy uh, need your feedback uh, is there any kind he can be diagnosed is speechless i'm from hyderabad okay so um, we need to really understand uh, more in detail we will need all your reports um, also we will need what, what is the condition of the seizures now um, for pure epilepsy we do not uh, do stem cell treatment but for brain damage uh, we could uh, check please do send us more details we will need to uh, see whether uh, if you've done an mri and what is the condition now and then we can give inputs about helping you the other question is can a youth of 21 years old have a stem cell therapy done he has diaplegic cerebral palsy would there be any exercise required after therapy and where can we get it done yes uh, there is a uh, 21 year old diaplegic cerebral palsy uh, can also undergo stem cell therapy uh, yes he will require a lot of exercises both physical therapy and aquatic therapy uh, we will initiate the therapy here at neurogen and then he can continue wherever they are locally Okay. Uh, mm. What's the next? Okay. Mm. So Nagraj, so Ranjit Kohli, what is the likely cost of this therapy for a 25-year-old adult? Please do send us an email. Our uh, my colleagues or coordinators will get back to you. First, we need to evaluate the patient's case. Um, Rachit, what is the maximum age up to which stem cell therapy can be can show improvement in CP patients? It depends on the type of CP, how severe it is. Uh, so we have treated 21, 25 year old, 28 year olds, and even a 40 year old. Um, so definitely, as the per person grows older, the possibility of improvement is lesser. But yes, but still, some amount of improvement can be attained depending on how severe the problem is. Hmm. What, what has been through clinical trials in India? Ranjit, I'm sorry, I didn't. I've not seen the whole question here, Ranjit. Ka. How to approach you, madam? Is it sufficient to do on, uh, one only one time? Please send us an email, uh, Manasa. Um, my email ID is there on the screen as well as you could send us an email at contact at neurogenbsi.com. Uh, that's the way you can contact us. We will get back to you. We'll take all the information. Again, depending on the severity of the problem, whether once is required or twice, would depend on how severe the brain damage is and what sort of a progress we see after the treatment. I did not get Ranjit's question. Ranjit Kohli question is not is half. Uh, Manasa, you have sent, I already sent my baby's report, so any suggestion? So uh, uh, ha I hope somebody has got back to you. We will check out and we'll get back to you, Manasa. Can I see Ranjit's complete question? What is, no, 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 the, there is another question after that. See, this question is only half. Has this, oh, the, has this been through clinical trials in India? Okay, okay. Uh, so there are different types of, it is, it has gone through a clinical study. Yes, uh, there is no comparison trial which has happened. But yes, studies have happened. Uh, all of that is published uh, in international peer-reviewed journals. Uh, please do um, look up our website and all our publications are available for cerebral palsy. Uh, clinical study has been done and that has been published. So you can see the results and the results have already presented to you this time. Can you tell your mail ID once again? Okay, I'm... This is my mail ID. If you can see the screen. Dr. Nandini76 at gmail.com or you can reach me and my colleagues at contact at neurogenbsi.com. So you can uh, go through the Neurogen uh, website as well and you will be able to uh, get a contact information there. Uh, do reach us on email. My Skype ID is Dr. Nandini76. 
you can reach me on Skype as well. Any more questions, please do feel free to send me an email and do give your feedback about the webinar. Have a good day. Bye.